अस्सलाम वालेकुम डॉक्टर एहसन अस्सलाम वालेकुम मैडम क्या हाल है कैसे कैसे हैं आप अल्लाह का शुक्र आप ठीक ठाक हैं खैरियत से मैडम बिल्कुल ठीक बिल्कुल ठीक थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग आपका वहां क्या टाइम है 6:30 मुझे यहां पर बस 7 बज गए हैं अभी 7 बज गए हैं बस ठीक है ठीक है बस हम ये 5 मिनट तक शुरू करते हैं 5 मिनट टोर शो टेक योर टाइम नो जी जी प्लीज अलकुम मैम एक्चुअली आप लोग अभी लाइव जा रहे हैं यूट्यूब पे तो आई सजेस्ट कि आप उस टाइम पे स्टार्ट कर लें इसको टाइम पे स्टार्ट कर लें मुझे आप थोड़ा ऑडियंस बताएं कितने हैं उस तरफ ना व्हाट्सएप पे बताएं चैट बॉक्स पे बताएं जी जी व्हाट्सएप पे व्हाट्सएप पे बताएं ओके स्टार्ट कर दे फिर सुल्तान साहब मैम ठीक है मैं कर देता हूँ स्टार्ट अब मुझे बताइएगा तो मैं फिर स्टार्ट करती हूँ मैम स्टार्ट हो गए जी रजीम रहीम आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ रिफा इंटरनेशनल यूनिवर्सिटी टू जॉइन दिस वेरी यूजफुल सेमिनार फ्लिप क्लासरूम लेट्स स्टार्ट विद द रेसिटेशन ऑफ होली कुरान एंड देन आई इंट्रोड्यूस अवर की नोट स्पीकर प्लीज اذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون يا ايها الذين امنوا استعينوا بالصبر 
الصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون صدق الله العظيم uh, Let me introduce our eminent educational leader and a scholar uh, Dr. Essen Sethi He has done his PhD in medical education from Dundee University, UK. And currently he's working as assistant professor in the Department of Public Health, College of Health Sciences, Qatar University, Qatar. He's also the program coordinator for certificate and master's program in health profession education under the Qatar University Health Research and Graduate Studies. Uh, Dr. Ahsan Sethi obtained his Bachelor of Dental Surgery and Master of Public Health from Pakistan. He completed his Master of Medical Education and PhD Medical Education uh, from Dundee University, UK, as I told you before. He also has been awarded a fellowship of Faculty of Dental and Trainers from Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, Fellowship of the Higher Education Academy and the membership of the Academy of Medical Educator in recognition of his commitment towards professionalism in teaching and learning in higher education. He is about to complete a fellowship in health profession education leadership from Famer Institute, Philadelphia, USA. So let me invite uh, Sir Essen Sethi. Please, you can start your session, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahila, for inviting me over to uh, this uh, seminar. And uh, thank you very much, FI University, as well. Uh, I've been there for previous seminars and workshop, and it's always a delight meeting all of you and knowing all of you as well and i can see that uh, you are in the attendees side so i think i'll be able to see your question and answers in the chat box as well uh, i'll try to take some of the questions uh, um, alongside or will the questions will be taken towards the end or i can take them alongside i think we'll see uh, whichever questions i can take and then most of the questions they will collect and then maybe ask it towards the very end as well uh, so let me share my screen and then we'll discuss it further. So is my screen visible to everyone, I hope. So I think the topic uh, that has been given to me today uh, relates with flipped classroom. Uh, this is a topic which is uh, a bit close to my heart as well, because uh, this is something which is really required and we really needed these days. And I think this is a uh, transformation uh, in our ways of thinking about how education and learning and everything happens. Uh, 
I think all of us as healthcare professionals, most of us here are healthcare professionals. And uh, if we look at our back, we have not been trained in education um, beforehand. Nowadays, certificate and master's courses are pretty common. But I think previously as a healthcare professionals, just because I'm a good professional, I'm a good dentist, I'm a good surgeon, I'm a good medical specialist, I would consider myself as a good teacher as well as a good educator as well. Um, for training in surgery or training in medicine, I would go ahead and read books, read journal articles, uh, look for best evidence in medicine as well, best evidence, CDC guidelines, NICE guidelines, and so many different things I need to look at before taking any decision. However, when it comes to educational practices, what I do is I just start teaching students the way I've been taught myself or whatever way I like. I think this uh, has changed recently over the period of time with increasing number of certificate and master's courses. And some of you, if not everyone, would be aware about the new teaching techniques, new teaching methodologies, and the new way in which teaching and learning is happening. And uh, I think one of those ways in which teaching and learning happens is flipped classroom as well. And uh, some people actually uh, started using it a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic era as well. And there's a reason because it aligns quite well with the technology and it aligns quite well with online learning and online education as well, where you have students in courses in Blackboard, in Moodle, you share materials with them. And in this way, you actually teach them uh, and have less time on the Zoom setting where um, a lot of people get Zoom fatigue as well and get tired as well. So I think a flipped classroom is a way uh, forward. It is not something to be left out after the COVID is gone or in the post pandemic, it is something to keep. And it has a lot of educational principles in it as well. And that is why I would strongly suggest that we should use that. Uh, ideally, if it would have been a class, I would have asked you, what would you like to learn? However, if you want to know anything specific or you want to add something specific, please feel free to add in the chat box. And I'm happy to answer any of your queries or any of your questions or take any uh, or discuss anything at length that you would want to do. Generally, uh, this is a picture. I think the first part of my session, I would like to discuss how uh, the students have changed, how we have changed, how different people have changed over the period of time. So this is something that uh, I have shown to a couple of students in my class and I asked them, what is this? And a lot of students these days in my first year class, find it very difficult to understand what is this. Then I ask them some of those who understand this, I ask them, have they actually seen this or have they actually played any audio on this as well in their life? And they're a bit unsure if they have ever played a video and they don't know how it actually works. And the next question then I ask them is about what's the relationship of this pencil with this cassette? So I think most of you were born in 80s, in 70s, or in 60s actually understand what is the relationship between this pencil and this cassette and how these two works because a lot of times uh, the record inside this cassette comes out and we used to actually put it back using this pencil and it was very commonly used or we used to do it through our fingers as well so this is something that we know as teachers but our students may not be familiar with these things which we are quite familiar so one thing that we need to understand is that the students that we are teaching is not how we are. That's why a lot of people say that if you, your age is 40 or 50 and you don't have a mentor whose age is 20 or 25, then you are not learning anything new. So you need to learn new things by making mentors who are from other generations as well. At the same time, those in 20 and 25 should learn from you about a lot of things, but we can't force them to follow or do the way that we used to do things. Likewise, how many of you have actually used this thing or this typewriter? How many of uh, the students would have done it or have seen it ever in their life? I think none. Because we have been using computers, we have been using laptops, we have been using iPads, devices, and so many different things which are commonly being used in our educational practices and in so many different places. I think this is something really common if you would have asked someone to write an assignment uh, these days, they would not be able to write it on a typewriter because the world has moved on. So this brings me about to different kinds of generations that we have in our understanding. So there are different kinds of generation, which includes the first earlier generation, which was 
during the post world war era and they are the builders because they started to build the economy started to build infrastructure started to build society after the depression of world war 2 if you ask them they would remember a big record player with a big round disc on it and i think a lot of people now put it in the museums or they put it in their drawing rooms because that's what reminds them that they have been affluent and they have been doing good in the past as well so it's something to be kept as a decoration piece rather than something to be used uh, a lot of people have still have it functional in a functional way and that's really nice as well then after that generation there is a generation so each generation almost stayed for 15 years 14 to 15 years and the next generation were baby boomers so they were post war baby and they created economic boom these people are currently at the age of 56 and 74 so some of the professors or some of the deans that we have in our colleges some institutions are from this era i would say and they may be the baby boomers so we have some of the people who are at the policy making positions at this level then there are people from generation x now generation x people know a lot of things as well in pakistan they have seen the 1965 war and 1971 war and they have done quite well they learned how to work in different organizations they learned about mathematics i think maths was really, was really important science was really important and that was introduced to them and uh, they remember i think in pakistan it was introduced quite late but uh, in america and other countries they used to have a walkman as well or a tape recorder or things like that likewise generation y which is also called the millennial generation these millennial generation people they have an ipods so i would say i'm from the millennial uh, millennial generation or generation y then there are generation z so some of my students are in generation z and in fact most of our medical students would be in generation z so imagine someone at the stage of baby boomers who themselves or generation x and even generation y and they would be teaching generation z people so i think there is a huge difference between the two and nowadays there is generation alpha which is coming up as well and they will be your future medical students as well in next 5 to 10 years time they have seen life in a very different way for us the best car was ford or toyota for them the best cars are tesla or autonomous cars they are living in the world of artificial intelligence with robots doing a lot of work their job market is different from us their demand their requirements are different from us so we need to prepare them in way so that they can live a different life so these are the three main common generations that we need to look into and there are certain differences between these generations as well generation x is more figured uh, thoughtful about work life balance and keeping a personal computer is the best thing they could have i remember getting a personal computer for myself uh, when i was doing my uh, matriculation examinations because i was so much interested in uh, having a computer and then internet used to came and there used to be a sound for dial up connection and so many different things that i can recall uh, and uh, having slow internet connections right now where i'm sitting it's uh, 200 mbps internet connection and i remember using i think 5 or 10 mbps connection and paying hefty amount for that um, when i started using internet as well i remember using uh, spending a lot of money for a pentium 500 computer which was a big thing because at that time there was pentium 1 going on pentium 2 going on pentium 3 and nowadays people are working in machines and smaller gadgets and what not so generation z is a bit different from us they are focused on more security more stability they use face time they use devices they stay in touch with each other they are multitaskers and nano computing as well let's watch a video and that will further highlight about how generations are changing and evolving as well Thank <laughs> you. 
So you have seen how generations are different. Why I'm discussing all this? Because I want to tell you that how the people that we're going to teach, the people we are currently teaching are different from us. And that is why they need to be taught in the way that they would like and they would be engaged in. They would be interested in. And it's important that we make learning relevant and meaningful for them as well. So the current students, they are increasingly digital. What do I mean by increasingly digital? So they have devices all around us. So how many devices right now you have around you? I think if I look at my screen, so I have this laptop, there's another laptop in my drawer back there for different other purposes. I have two mobile phones over there. I have a TV screen as well and other devices as well that we are working on an iPad and things like that. I'm sure you have multiple devices at the same time with you as well. Which means that all of us are increasingly using that. But I remember uh, using Facebook before that I was using Orchid. I was using so many different things. But these days, uh, the younger generation are more into Instagram. They are more into Snapchat, something that I feel kind of not being very familiar with. OK, I do use Instagram sometimes. But I still don't use and I still don't understand how to use Snapchat. Uh, so I'm uh, not very old or uh, I don't want to sound very old, but uh, I think I still could not figure out how useful or how all those filters work and everything works, which the younger generation are doing these days. I don't want to do it. Uh, that's another reason as well. So they are increasingly digital. The other thing that they actually prefer is collaboration. They are the people who want to collaborate. I think me, uh, what I have learned in my life throughout and what I've been taught throughout is to be competitive, to compete with different people all the time. And I think uh, because I have been doing different qualifications from different places, so most of the qualification that I have done that taught me how to be competitive and they gave me grades, they gave, told me that I have a distinction or I have a this position or first division or these are my marks. This is my GPA. And that is why I was always competing with different people, different colleagues, different students. And I remember there were a lot of students in my classroom who were not sharing notes with each other, who were not talking to each other. They used to lie with each other, different for different various reasons. However, the newer generation is more into collaboration. And I think one of the course that I'm currently doing they don't give me 100 out of 100 or 90 out of 100 marks. They only tell me that, okay, you have completed this activity or you have not completed this activity. Anyone who has completed the activity, they get a completion certificate and that's it. Which encourages us, us to help each other complete that activity rather than um, trying to push or move each other aside. So we all pull together everyone we collaborate, we learn from each other, and we are all completing that course in the future. And I think this is something which is really common in current students and the current Z generation students that we are teaching, that they like to collaborate. Now, all these things have implications for education because this means that we need to give them less activities which encourages competition and more activities that encourages collaboration. Likewise, if we look at these people, they are more social. They socialize more, they go out more. They are more, a lot of them are extroverts as well. They go out, they move to different places. They like to explore the world. They like to travel. And I, I think you have, may have seen that the amount of people who are traveling abroad these days to different places from even Pakistan and a lot of people who are coming to Pakistan for tourism and tourism worldwide is a booming industry because the newer generation is quite social. I remember uh, for a very long time, I could not move out of my house without my parents' permission or without them. Going to another city was a difficult thing. Nowadays, children and different people are actually traveling worldwide into different countries. There are youth hostels, there are a lot of support programs. And I remember there used to be not many organizations, but these days students have IFMSA, AMSA, so many different bodies. And they are international level bodies where they invite students from different colleges to actually come to them. Uh, they have annual or yearly uh, some meetings as well in different countries. And a lot of students are traveling for that as well. 
they are increasingly digital and super connected with each other so even though you would see that someone sitting there on a sofa alone but they may be super connected with thousands of people hundreds of people or even millions of people i can see like you may have seen on instagram a lot of people are following other people they are sharing their live recordings live videos live pictures i'm not saying that you start doing all those things but we need to understand how they are what their interest areas are what they actually like and we need to give them those things accordingly so they are digitally super connected which means that if i have to implement flip classroom i would incorporate a lot of things that are related to digital media as well this does not mean that flip classroom can only be done in a digital environment no it can be done in another ways but digital environment actually helps and support a lot of students as well they like personalization of learning so i remember when i was enrolled in different courses we never used to have electives even if someone used to do an elective they would do it on their own voluntary work nowadays electives are becoming an important part of school likewise when we used to get an assignment or anything we used to get it in a very directed and detailed way that this is what you need to do and this is what is important as well on the other hand these days when students get assignments they are being asked to reflect on their own context write things which are relevant to their own um, environment something that they can relate to something that they can personalize i remember when i was writing a research article i could not use first person pronouns we used to write it in a third person pronoun but nowadays even writing that article a lot of people are writing it in first person pronoun as well so personalization is very important i think facebook has played a big role in that as well that it has personalized a lot of things as well you get the advertisements that relates with your personality there are algorithms going on in google search in facebook and so many different bodies to look at your choices your preferences and then they give you that thing. you can try that at home use google five people using five different devices that they have been using enter the same word and you'll see that all of you will get different websites and different arrangements as well why because google will provide you something that relates with what you actually really like so we can see that generation z is a bit different they 30% when we ask the students in generation z in one of the surveys and not we but uh, on, in an online survey is that 30% watch lessons online so they are doing a lot of things which are online 20% read textbooks on tablets 30% work with classmates online and 50% use youtube or social media for research assignments i remember only going to get a textbook and that is what we used to have to do any kind of work nowadays they are going to libraries sitting in libraries searching online and information is also accessible i think our technology has changed and it has helped us and made sure that the information is also quite accessible and that's why i'm saying that uh, and i always say that students used to be just consumers of knowledge and the perception um in earlier times was that the children are empty vessels and as a teacher i have full of knowledge and i'll just keep on saying about all the things and the empty vessels of students will keep on filling and that is how learning will transfer knowledge will transfer but now we understand that learning does not transfer in that way we have constructivism we have constructive students who actually think and they construct new learning based on their prior learning they adapt they modify and that is why they are not just the consumers but they are also the producers of knowledge as well and that is why you have seen a lot of introduction of different activities like problem based learning activities like um, team based learning activities like case based learning uh, and so many different things why because students role has increased into producers as well as consumers and that is a new term called prosumers of knowledge so current students are prosumers of knowledge and that is why we should not 
actually mistake them for millennials. So I'm a millennial. And if I'm going to Generation Z, and some of you would be even from before that. So there's a difference. We in our time used to have maximum two screens. They have they are working on five screens. We I, I, I remember using a pager at one point. I remember doing a lot of SMS. They communicate using emoticons, images, and so many things. We used to share things. They actually create things. You have seen a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of new people, a lot of younger generation doing a lot of great work because they live in a generation that creates things. So encourage them to create in your learning activities. We are focused on present. They are future focused. We are more optimist. They are realist. And we want to be discovered and want to work for success. They make sure that they are successful in their life. There are some other good things about them as well. They are less narcissist than millennials. So narcissism, for those who don't know, means something with extreme self-involvement that it's just me I need to think about and I'm not going to think about others. We are known as a selfie generation. We are so much into each other. I'm not saying they are even selfie generation as well, but maybe they are taking more grand fees as well. They collaborate. A survey of 11,000 generations years found 69% would rather be smarter than better looking. So they prefer to be smart than better looking these days. They are frugal, which means they're not wasteful in terms of money because they have grown up in a recession time in Pakistan. We don't work on credit, so we don't understand what recession really means, but they would rather save money than spend it. Our times we used to spend a lot of money as well. They have different, they want to change the world for better. There are a lot of videos on YouTube where you would see a lot of younger generation, younger kids doing a lot of good work uh, in different parts of the world as well. And they seek quality. The product themselves are more important to Generation Z than brands that please them. And they will change brands easily in search of higher quality. I think we have seen a transformation from people who are using Nokia to moving on to iOS, Apple. A lot of people still say that uh, Apple does not produce anything different in their mobiles. They're just copying, pasting exactly the same thing. But I think the quality of experience is increasing for a lot of people. And that is why a lot of people who start using Apple products, they still stay with Apple products as well. Likewise, who would have imagined that these cars, there will be a car like Tesla car. We never imagined, but that provides you a better quality of life. You don't have to worry about the roads. You don't have to worry about a lot of things. On your voice command, it does a lot of things. So one thing that we need to understand, Tom Herrick very rightly pointed out and very rightly said, is that 21st century kids are being taught by 20th century adults using 19th century curriculum and techniques on an 18th century curriculum. So even if we don't go into 18th century, we can see that a 19th century curriculum or a 19th century calendar. Also, let's make it even simpler and easier, 20th century. Even then you need to understand that the kids that we are going to teach, they are from another century or they are of a different generation. And that is why we need to adapt and we need to start thinking about newer and different methodologies so that we can engage them. A general survey of a medical school, I think all of you should do this survey in your medical school so that you understand what kind of faculty you have and what kind of students you have from which generation. So generally we would see that most of the faculty are from the generation X, some faculty from generation Y, and in, among students, most of the students are from generation Z and few students from Y and X. Maybe X would be in the postgraduate training environment. So we can still keep a lot of things for postgraduate, but if you see that generation X and generation Z, I think there's a big difference. And that is what we need to understand that this is what needs to change. From my uh, experience, and even now lectures are still quite common. I'm not saying that we get rid of the lecture or the concept of uh, getting a lecture uh, at home, but I think it's large group teaching environment, which is completely teacher-centered. 
what do i mean by teacher centered is that where teacher is on the stage and he is just talking talking and talking and moving from one side to the other side without any interaction without asking or discussing anything with the students or maybe discussing something and engaging just the students sitting on the front benches i myself i would say i was a back bencher as well and i was very much disengaged with a lot of lectures that we used to do and i remember there used to be some people who used to just play transparencies and they used to darken the room and we used to just hang out and sleep and just relax at the back that okay it's the end of the day it's a dark room and we can just relax and whatever time we used to study we used to study on our own the other thing is we used to assume in this time in lectures that the teacher teaches and it automatically leads to learning this reminds me of a very uh, famous comic uh, that um, harden used to uh, put in a lot of his presentations as well where he mentioned that there were two friends and one of the student told the other stu other student or other friend that today i taught snoopy how to whistle so snoopy was the name of his dog so his friend was really impressed that the his friend is saying that he taught his dog how to whistle so he went to the dog and he asked the dog that snoopy uh, can you whistle snoopy was quiet and did not respond he went again and asked snoopy snoopy can you whistle snoopy was again quiet and did not respond he went back to his friend and said but snoopy is saying that he cannot whistle so his friend said yeah i told you i taught him how to whistle i did not say that he actually learned it so i think one thing that we need to understand is that teaching is different from learning and we need to move from teaching of teachers towards learning of learners these are different things so in a lecture what used to happen is students used to prepare before the class so some of the good students they used to read they used to know what was the lecture about and they used to do some reading about it and they used to spend the class time listening to the lecture and they used to get a lot of activities or what i used to do is i used to just sleep in the class and then later on during my preparation my exam i used to study in groups or ask my friends and go to seniors and they used to point me out that okay these are the things that you need to study these are the things that you need to read these are the things you should work upon and that is how you are working about the future but did you ever wonder in that class if i had the opportunity or if anyone had the opportunity to rewind that lecture and maybe sitting in the preparation you may have thought like what if i could have actually seen my teacher present again while sitting on my very nice cozy sofa or while i'm preparing or doing something else and sometimes i used to get frustrated about it as well that okay what did my teacher said why i did not listen to him i should have listened to him now i am struggling with this thing and i developed my own understanding a lot of things as well what this is what it is not so i think there were some disadvantages some issues with lecture i'm not saying we get rid of it but we need to make it more interactive as well what usually used to happen in a lecture was there used to be a teacher and trust me in a lot of books uh, especially in one uh, article from harden he called such teachers as walking radios because all they are doing is talking like a radio and walking from one place to another place and that is it so even if you put a radio on and play they will do the job and i think we need to really change that as well so what usually happens in large group class and in such sessions is teacher is just teaching the syllabus he is focused on that and the students are thinking about he is uh, so just try and see a lot of people are actually scribbling down and making different things on their books or talking to each other she might be thinking about it's too cold outside i'm i'm sure that it's a lot of cold in pakistan right now so it's too cold outside and someone might be thinking about exam or is it important for the exam will that come in the exam what i need to study for the exam so students have different ideas different thought process and here the teacher needs to engage the audience and engage the learner and that is why the teaching techniques needs to change 
So what is a lecture? According to ordinal, lecture is a process by which notes of a teacher become the notes of a student without passing through the minds of either. So this is exactly the kind of teaching that we need to avoid. And that is why we have flipped classroom and that is one of the most, uh, uh, I would say, engaging uh, teaching technique. Uh, there are a lot of advantages with some limitations that we're going to discuss in our session today. And uh, I'll give you some tips on how you can make it successful in your settings as well. So one thing that has changed with the lecture is that the teachers needs to evolve from being the stage on the stage to becoming the guide on the side. And we have seen over the period of time uh, evolution in terms of different student-centered teaching and learning strategies. Student-centered means where student is doing a lot of job and teacher's role is there to guide us. So teacher, it's just like, um, if I want to teach you about swimming, uh, do you think I'll just lecture you about swimming and you learn about it? Or if I want to teach you about cycling, I will just lecture about cycling and you learn about that. I think it's not like that. You need to sit on the cycle yourself as a student and you need to jump into the swimming pool yourself. And my job would be to stand on the side with a tube in my hand, just in case if you're drowning, then I'll provide you support with that tube. Or I'm just there to provide a scaffold for you. By scaffold, I mean like when you're making houses, you do some temporary uh, support until the lenter or the actually ceiling actually holds itself. This is the temporary support which you takes away over the period of time. So the role of teacher has evolved as well. Role of teacher has changed as well. And that is what has resulted in flipped classroom as well. And this is an approach that transfers learning responsibility from teacher to the student. This is the most important aspect. And I think everywhere you go worldwide, and all the literature actually supports this thing as well, that we need to make our learning more learner-centered or more student-centered. And this is what I want and I expect from you as well. And I think here, flipped classroom is really useful and really helpful, and it's a very nice learner-centered approach. What usually happens in a traditional classroom? In class, we deliver lecture, some good teachers deliver videos as well. And there's a lot of content delivery that is happening. Then we give a lot of tasks to our students. Some give tasks, some don't give tasks. But even if you don't give tasks, students actually study or learn on their own, or they have their student groups, or they go to library, or they discuss it with each other, whatever has been discussed in the lecture. They get homework, they solve problems, they get worksheets to answer or respond, they get questions in the exam to answer and they have a lot of discussion issues or discussion points as well, which they are doing out of the class. So why it is called flipped? Because this is exactly what they have flipped. Because they believe that for lecture video, I think it's important that the time, the teacher's time is also important and the teacher's energy is also important. And we should not spend, the teacher should not, should be spending his time very wisely. He should not be, thinking about how to tell someone about the definition of something because anyone can go and read their definition themselves. I think the teacher's job is to help the students engage with critical and difficult concepts and help them understand that what uh, different things are. And that is what has been flipped. So nowadays in the flipped classroom format, the out of the class activities become in-class activities. So students do homework, problems, worksheets and discussions inside the classroom. And the lectures and videos and content delivery happens out of the class. So this is what flipped classroom is all about. And if we look at the entire cycle, what we do as teachers in a flipped classroom format is we develop different materials. We think about this is the material that I'm going to cover. This is the material that I'm going to teach. And we provide it could be in the form of videos, it could be in the form of uh, um, lectures, it could be in the form of a YouTube video, it could be in the form of a chapter of the book, it could be in the form of an article. Whatever resources that we have developed or we have produced or if they're resources even from someone else, we just collect them and we provide them to the students so that they go through it beforehand. And we tell the students that in the classroom, there are certain activities that you have sorted out for them 
and in those activities the students will actually practice and apply the concept that they have learned for i'm sure it's not doable initially because what happens is we give a task to the student a lot of students initially will not come prepared and what would happen in the class that you end up teaching them all those different topics as well this is what we need to avoid students need to understand and they need to know that they need to come prepared for the class otherwise they will not be involved in their cannot learn anything in the class and they will not be able to practice and apply concepts so this is important where students needs to be made responsible and it will only happen if you would not revert to lecturing them all the time so make sure you provide them activities before the classroom then in the classroom they apply and practice all those concepts they do homeworks you have worksheets for them you have small group tasks for them activities for them you have problems for them to solve problems for them to discuss or different other discussions activities as well this helps in understanding you as a teacher here would be observing all those activities would be seeing what students are doing and you will be giving them feedback and tell them how they can improve it better and then you have prepared a task for consolidation which they again do out of the class and they consolidate what they have learned before the class during the class and apply it to the concept of the class but a lot of activities before and during the class would help them do the job after the class is done and i think that will encourage consolidation of what they have learned so a lot of learning is happening out of the class and in the classroom it's quite engaging it's quite learner centered and the role of teacher is there to support learners with all those activities so this is a classic way of traditional and flipped and this explains what has been flipped so lecture and homework activities that is how it used to be but now lecture they can watch online and classroom activities is something that is going to happen in the class as well so flip classroom is a reconceptualization of how pre during and post class time is utilized by lecture and students so we need to reconceptualize and we need to rethink about how our pre lecture time during the lecture time and post class time can be better utilized and that is reconceptualization is referred to as flipped classroom the activity is traditionally conducted in the classroom for example content presentation become home activities so instead of lecturing in the class i would just record my lecture and give it to my students to read it to go through it at home so this is one time effort once you have done with that all you need to do in the class is just have a discussion you will be more engaged and your students will be more engaged in the class as well so students prepare for the class at the time and pace that suits them i think this is another important thing which uh, likely refers to uh, competency based education is like everyone is different all of us are different we're not the same people you and i have different learning styles you have i uh, have different competencies different level of understanding some of you might learn something in 10 minutes that would take me one hour to actually understand that you may be uh, liking to read books or articles i would like to watch videos i would like to do visuals so why should everyone be treated and taught in the same way so there is a question from dr rafia that suggests some strategies to ensure that students come to the class prepared so behaviorism in a way i would not say that you just be very stringent and strict about it but i think team based learning actually provides one solution where you ask the students that whenever they come to the class the first thing that is going to happen is that they will be assessed on what they have gone through in the home work activity so if you have given them a lecture then introduce a kahoot or a socrative activity using so kahoot socrative or any paper based mcqs where you ask students okay you will be checked if you have learned anything or not if you are not going to want to do that you can inculcate peer evaluation of their colleagues as well because each group has to perform an activity and if everyone is not doing work outside the classroom then they would not be able to contribute effectively and then their peers will be affected as well so behaviorism only to the extent where you can actually suggest that grades would be an issue 
and students need to be engaged using testing techniques that we use as well. How many flipped classrooms should be conducted per week? I think you can use as many as you want. Uh, there's no harm. It's all about your preparation because the first time that you are uh, providing flipped classroom, uh, that may be a difficult time. I know a lot of schools that have totally transformed into flipped classroom and team-based learning activities where they have from, from day one of the course, they develop teams uh, of different students uh, and they grade them, okay, this is team one, team two, team three. And what happens is that they actually tell them in every uh, team-based learning activity, anyone who's answering most of the questions and scores higher, they keep on recording their grades. And towards the end of the year, after 10, 15 or 20 sessions, whichever amount of sessions you have, they actually get rewarded that, okay, this team actually did perform the best. And this member of this team actually performed the best just like you play around. So you have to introduce gamification as well when you are introducing these activities. So what can be done if students have not read? I think it's important. One thing is you need to identify the students and feedback would be really important at this point. So I'm sure initially there will be challenges. One thing that you need to do is you need to send them a clear message that you are not going to lecture them. So if they are not coming prepared, they would not be able to perform well in the class and they need to feel that. I think they would come unprepared once, twice, third time, but ultimately if they realize that this is not how things will be working and you're not going to change and shift into a lecture mode for everything, they would change their mindset as well. Because students actually think that if we don't come to the class prepared, we'll still be able to learn and convince teacher to lecture us. So I think you need to make a statement and make it very clear from day one that I'll be using this approach and this is how it's going to work. And maybe it's important that you set some ground rules early on as well. So set some ground rules and tell them that this is how it's going to work and this is how I'm going to teach. And that should actually go in that way. Is it only good for higher education? Uh, I think it's not necessary for higher education. This principle can be used in uh, different other primary education and different other formats as well. Do you think this method is suitable for clinical skill teaching? Because we usually give concept first, then demonstration, then skill sign off. So I need to know, is this good for school? I think a lot of uh, videos you can send a lot of materials. And if students are actually doing that beforehand, it's better. I remember doing one of the project with one of my master's student is what we have done is we uh, send them different videos of how the skill needs to be performed. We send them materials about the steps of that skill and students went through it beforehand. When they come to the classrooms, we made their smaller teams, smaller groups. And in that group, we asked each individual to perform and the other peers were actually helping them perform that. So they were performing it individually. Then they were performing and helping each other perform those skills in their classroom. And as a teacher, my job was only to observe them and only to see if that they are going, doing the right thing. Because they have seen the video and they just need to follow it. At least one person in that group would be able to help each other out. So we introduced peer assisted learning as well as, and then we used OSCE. I went to each station and when each group said that we are prepared, I used to randomly pick one person from that team and say, okay, perform it. And they used to get marks in OSCE as well. This way, uh, the students were encouraged to actually learn with each other and from each other as well. So what could be the optimal number of students for flipped classroom strategy? I think uh, it's all depends on your resources, how much resources you have at hand. Um, one experience that we had at Northwest School of Medicine is that we uh, asked all the demonstrators or all the lecturers who, are, who have done MBBS or BDS that why we call them, he's a lecturer of anatomy or demonstrator of anatomy or physiology, biochemistry. They are all MBBS people. So whenever we used to have small group activities, they used to form part of the common pool. And all of them used to get engaged in certain sessions, which used to be there throughout the year. So there wasn't, it's not like the lecturer or demonstrator of anatomy will only teach anatomy, but he will be or may be involved in so many other flipped classroom or team-based learning or problem-based learning sessions as well. So tutorials, if run, you, you can either switch your tutorials or you can switch your lectures in flipped classroom, it's up to you. 
as long as you are following the approach of flip classroom, you can use that. The other question is from Hamza. It seems flip classroom is more beneficial in preclinical settings. I think it's both. Even for clinical, there are a lot of videos available and they can practice a lot of things. And like I said, if you make them do a lot of things in peers, peer groups, and you provide them with a checklist that this is the level of performance, these are the steps that you need to perform. Students can learn from each other and students can help each other learn as well. And your job would be there. You'd say, instead of teaching, you can go there. You say, okay, I'll do a formative OSCE. One of you perform and you can give feedback to them as well at the same time. So it's not like only for preclinical, but you can also use it for clinical settings as well. How to address the issue of gadgets and internet connectivity? I think this is beyond uh, the domain of this lecture. Internet connectivity uh, is something that uh, we can't manage, but I think uh, if uh, internet connectivity uh, these days, even mobiles have uh, connectivity, 3G and 4G is available everywhere. If you send someone a link on YouTube or even you create your own videos and send them a link, okay, this is watch this on Vimeo or download this or provide a PDF document. I think every day on WhatsApp, we are getting so many different messages with PDF and so many different activities and posters. We can look at one of the lecture as well uh, or one of the videos from, from uh, my teacher as well, if I want. What about the formal environment students want to have at home? Uh, I think it's up to the students uh, to think about what environment makes them more comfortable. So I would not say that we ask them that they need to sit on a chair and table to actually perform all those activities. If they, whatever environment they feel comfortable in, and I think this is the flexibility with flipped classroom that you learn something at uh, your own comfort zone. So what can be done to prevent the creation of a digital divide, which may be a consequence of flipped classroom? Um, I think you, I'm not sure what do you mean by digital divide? So I think uh, if you're talking about us, the divide between us and the students, I think we need to learn uh, some of the digital and faculty development everywhere in the world or everywhere. I think it involves teaching the faculty about some e-learning tools, some tips. There should be instructional designers and uh, different colleges who are adopting flip classroom with online learning and digital learning as well. Uh, and they should be helping out the students and as well as the faculty as well with a lot of things. So there are good IT departments in every university. Are the lecturers knowledgeable enough to identify the confusion and answer the student queries? And I think lecturers would be there, but they uh, will have a tutor guide with them as well. So we can say that they are for the small group activities and tutor guides will be able to help them and will be useful for them. However, obviously a professor would be there. If lecturers find something difficult, then I'm sure a professor would be able to answer that. In any case, I uh, always think I've been teaching a lot of courses here as well. Remember that if you have done MBBS and you are teaching a student who is in the first year or second year or third year, you're always one step ahead from them. You're always a bit more knowledgeable from them. And I think even if you're not, that will be useful for your own knowledge and learning as well. And you can search and you can ask or refer to the professor for that. Is post-assessment necessary part? No, it's not necessary part. However, one of the application of flipped classroom is team-based learning. And that team-based learning has three uh, different forms of assessment in the form of IRAT, TRAT, and different techniques as well. So Ubaidullah has a question. This method of teaching will be objectionable for those students who are not preparing their homework and also for their parents. I think uh, students should not object if they are being asked to prepare at home, if they have uh, engaged or if they have uh, enrolled for a certain course, um, they are obliged to learn in that way. And uh, I think we need to understand, make their parents understand as well that this is what evidence says, that this is a better approach. And I'll be sharing in my next slide and few slides that how many benefits you get out of it. So I think when we encourage the parents and tell them that these are the benefits of this approach, then they, and what parents would ask, parents would ask you to lecture. You have already recorded your lecture and that lecture is available online on YouTube or on a learning management system already there. So it's not like students are not getting a lecture, but they will be going through the lecture in their own time rather than in the classroom. Your classroom time will have more activities, more discussion for understanding and deeper concepts. How do we align flipped class with assessment? I think uh, for assessment, you need to align it with the learning objectives rather than with the flipped class. But yes, one thing that we need to do is if your learning objectives are higher order thinking, 
your teaching learning activities should refer to higher order thinking as well and higher order cognition as well and your assessment should be c3 level as well and i think uh, if your assessment is going to be c1 level which is just recall then i think flip classroom people will be less engaged however if students would know that their exam mcqs will be of higher cognitive thinking level then they will be more engaged in class discussions because they would like to understand the concept in order to do that assessment as well and like you mentioned assessment drives learning as well so it would be very important as well so uh, fahad azam has asked digital divide between the student as in those students who are more comfortable with the use i think uh, it's good when you are making groups you can do a small quick survey with the students that if you are good with those students make groups or make teams with people so that they can help others who are not and it's a formative activity in the end if someone is not good they'll be able to learn there's no stopping to learn i every other day i learn new things from my students as well so we can learn new technologies we can always learn due to information overload in the flip classroom i think you need to avoid information overload you need to provide them the content that is less overloaded in a fashion which is less overloaded you do not need to just finish the task you need to ensure learning is happening at the same time and why you are saying that information overload will happen in a flipped classroom it's the same amount of information that you are giving them in the lecture you need to think about why information overload is happening even in your lectures then so it's the same thing if it is happening in your lecture it is also happening in the Uh, uh, homework as well, and I think this is what you need to avoid. Will that be right to give the introduction of the topic, then move over to flip session? Why give introduction to the topic and waste your time? I think uh, our time is precious as well. If I have to give a definition of health, that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Then uh, students can read it on their own. What you can do is you can ask them to apply that. that what does they mean by social well being a lot of us don't know that even social well being comes under uh, health a lot of public health activities that we are having they are just focused on disease prevention and that's it what about the social well being of people what about the mental health of a lot of people as well yes training is always important training related to flip classroom training related to team based learning training related to the digital tools that they can use and i think people can work together in groups and develop different resources and share resources with each other as well and sometimes you don't even have to create your own resources you can just download something from a youtube there are a lot of nice videos on coursera on youtube i remember giving my students a lot of uh, courses using coursera i just used to send them the link ask them to register ask them to go through that uh, those videos and then even get a certificate from coursera as well which is always free or mostly free does it not increase on screen time i think this is one of the disadvantages that i'm going to discuss later on so yes uh, these are one of the limitations especially when you are focusing on doing flipped classroom online that screen time would definitely increase and i think this is one of the cons i totally agree with you hamza so let let me move on for a, a bit and then i'll come back to some of the questions that are being asked so um, and so at the same time you guys keep on populating different questions and i'll be taking it in a while so now talking about the advantages of flipped classroom so a lot of us are talking that how we can convince the students how we can convince teach uh, their parents if there are issues i think refer back to bloom's taxonomy i hope most of you or some of you would be remembering what a bloom's taxonomy is so bloom's taxonomy refers to how our cognition actually works how different levels of cognition are there and this is a model where they say that remembering is the lower order thinking understanding is higher than application is above that analyzing is even higher than evaluating and creating new knowledge as well so in traditional knowledge what usually happens is that teachers introduce new materials so just like there was a question on introduce it so we are just introducing the topic we are telling them okay these are the things you need to remember these are the things you need to understand and students are responsible for application analyzing evaluating and creating i think this is what has been flipped in flipped classroom as well where new material is introduced to the students outside of class as their homework so you don't need to help students to remember i remember my teacher showing me classifications and big 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 slides with a lot of material that we just need to remember or just need to understand 
is there is any difficulty in understanding and they can write down their questions and they can ask in the class but what used to happen is when i used to study on my own i used to get a lot of questions which i could never actually ask my teachers so new materials introduced in the flip classroom that students do as homework and a lot of higher order thinking is work is what is being done in the classroom so this is what has changed and this is what is the advantage of flip classroom model in traditional classroom students arrive and settle in 5 minutes so we give them 5 minutes just like right now this is a traditional classroom so it took us 5 minutes to start the session then you spend some time revising what happened in the last question or maybe some people like to ask questions about the last topic that they taught and then they lecture for 30 to 45 minutes and then there's 10 to 20 minutes of guided learning or any activity you give them and that is what a one hour lecture looks like in a flip classroom model students arrive and settle in 5 minutes you question them or maybe give them a, an irat individual readiness assurance test or a team readiness assurance test or something like that just to assess that they have learned in their previous in the materials that you have shared with them and in 45 minutes there's guided independent and cooperative learning that is happening among the students so amount of interaction among students you have increased as well and i think this is one of the biggest advantage and i think they will be able to understand they will be able to in be more engaged they will be discussing a lot of things with each other they will be learning everything from each other as well so i think these are some of the things which we need to talk to about to our students talk to about with our Uh, their parents as well, if they have any concerns or if they have any issues as well. So, I think flip. So, uh, in one of the FLN's four pillars of uh, flip classroom, they say flip stands for these different terminologies. Like F is for flexible environment, L is for learning culture, I is for intentional content, and P is for professional educator. Now, what does that actually mean? Is you need to provide them with flexible environment so flexibility it's not like you just send them a, a, a whole article or a whole book chapter or a big video to watch in one day you give them the entire week you upload that material on learning management system or you email them at least one week before and just tell them in your own flexible time in your own flexible space whenever you have time go through that material you need to be flexible with the timelines because all students are different they are not the same so we were asking question about proper office spaces you can see in the pictures someone is just lying on the sofa i do a lot of work and uh, send emails to a lot of people while just lying down on my sofa while watching any movie or anything like that or while playing music behind me or any other activity that i'm doing so this is fine and i think this is one of the core element of flip classroom the second thing that we have is learning culture so we need to inculcate that culture in our students as well that this in class time is for learning for greater in depth understanding where you need to develop learning opportunities it's not like you just leave students for discussion on their own you need to inculcate activities you need to develop cases you need to allow them to apply the concept that they have learned uh, at home in the class so you need to develop activities for them and you need to ask them if they have any questions any things that they are unclear about and you are always there to support with the tube in your hand so that no one drowns so you will provide scaffold to your students as well encourage peer assisted learning for support encourage senior students to teach in certain classes encourage your demonstrators or lecturers to help you out with different things as well i stands for intentional content so flipped learning educators determine what they need to teach and what material students should handle on their own so educators use intentional content to maximize classroom time in order to adopt method of student centered active so intentional learning refer to the specific material or specific content that you are going to share and that is what is part and the last one don't think that it is an easier thing i think creating a lot of resources puts a lot of pressure on teachers early on as well and um right now currently i am developing a blended model master's course and 
um, a lot of online learning with a lot of flipped classroom activities uh, based uh, master's course in medical education in Qatar University. And uh, I think what we have requested is that each teacher gets one credit hour for teaching and they get one credit hour for its development as well. So uh, it's not like that you will be just teaching. Development itself requires more time. However, the advantage is that we told them this would be only the first time. The next time we don't need credit R for development because it will be merely revising. And all we need to do is in the class encourage discussion and all that. So I think the first time it will be a lot of work, but later on life will become easier and a lot of things will become easier from that point as well. And answering the question that why we need to do flipped classroom activities. So these are different advantages that you need to discuss and tell uh, all the parents, all the students as well, that it encourages active learning. You can have a peer assisted learning as well where students are helping each other. Uh, you can encourage peers to uh, work in groups, collaborate. And I think if you put together different students in a different way, you will be amazed to see that how good these students are when you engage them and allow them to work in groups with each other. Collaborative learning, cooperative learning, these are all different new models that people use. Jigsaw model, self-directed learning is also happening uh, over here, and maybe some directed self-learning is also there. I think students learn from the hidden curriculum. If they know that our teacher will tell everything in the class through the lecture, they will never think about all these different things. So you need to encourage them and you need to engage them that this is what they need to do. So uh, blended learning is another thing. Blended learning in the form of like online learning and as well as you face-to-face -face teaching, you can blend these together and digitally enhanced as well. It's not like you can't do flipped classroom without digital technology. But I think with digital technology, it's really useful and really helpful as well. And I think it needs to be very closely aligned with competency-based education as well. I think flipped classroom actually helps with competency-based education as well. So what is competency-based education? Competency-based education is where the teacher time is actually, uh, time in training is usually what happens is that time in training for students is usually fixed and standard achieved is variable. But what happens in competency-based education is that standard achieve is fixed and time in training is very good. So I think it aligns really well with flipped classroom as well, because you allow the students to learn something on their own time with the flexibility of almost a week that they can study it in this entire week in whatever fashion they like, and then they come to the class prepared and that is how they do it. And it helps engage the learners from lower order thinking to higher order thinking level as well. So I'll take a few more questions before moving on. Let's see. So there is a question. What is the difference between self-directed learning, flipped classroom and team-based learning? Team-based learning is basically an application of flipped classroom uh, learning. So it's not different. It's the same thing technically. Are we comfortable with C3 level assessment in preclinical years? It's, it's a question. I think you need, we need to start pushing the students. And the other thing is we will only be comfortable when we will be using such activities and we will be training our students at C3 level as well. Obviously, if you are going to emphasize more on the definitions of things uh, only on uh, the C1 level, and if you're going to teach everything at C1 level, you cannot take assessment at C3 level. So to make them comfortable, we need to encourage debates, encourage discussions, encourage learners and activities. So the, and encourage more application activities, and then you will be able to assess them at higher level as well. Dr. Rafia asked, we have implemented flipped classroom and team-based learning last year. Students loved it, but they expect the teachers to repeat the topic in lecture course. So uh, Dr. Rafia, one solution that I have for that is that repeat the topic in lecture. So if you have used flipped classroom and team-based learning effectively, you would have developed all the recordings as well. If they want to repeat, they can always go online and play it again. Everything is recorded. So you don't repeat the topic yourself. You just tell them, okay, I've sent you the recording. Just go through it again. And everything should be available in LMS. So Dr. Masood Kokhar asked, acceptability and motivation of students for flipped classroom is affected by so many factors. They are used to lecture-based 
in pre med level and passing exam are mostly the only extrinsic motivation please comment and offer i think this is a very important question and students are very wise they will be difficulty in first second third or fourth session but you will be amazed but you have to make a statement and make sure that they understand that this is how it is going to be now and you're not going to lecture them once they realize that they will start coming to your class with that i'll give you simple example with attendance i remember when i started teaching over here students used to come after 5 minutes and they used to say that uh, okay some you are coming after 10 minutes and they say doctor every other professor marks our attendance i told them 5 minutes after 5 minutes i'm not going to mark your attendance that's it full stop day 1 day 2 day 3 day 4 everyone was unhappy about it after that everyone started coming on time so you need to have set some certain ground rules you need to explain it to them that advantage you need to tell them this is how it's going to be and you're not going to deliver a lecture and i think you need to uh, follow that in latin spirit as well could you explain uh, flip class to asynchronous interest so asynchronous session refers to uh, learning that is happening where teacher and students are in different time and place so yes the first part the part at home will be asynchronous as well and then the work that is going to be done in the classroom that would be the synchronous session on campus it could be on campus it could be using zoom it could be using different ways as well but in the synchronous session is where the application is usually happening so what sort of activities we can have during these sessions so i think some of that activities will be covered in uh, future in some of the slides that i am going to share and uh, i'll be sharing some of the slide on technology as well that we can use so i think uh, let's wait for that and then i'll come back to your answers if they are not answered uh, flip classroom is a kind of blended learning what do you think about this yes i think blended learning can be used effectively to implement flip classroom so I'm, i won't say that it is totally blended learning um i remember working at uh, dandi university where beforehand they used to print out a lot of materials and they used to uh, post a lot of uh, chapters book chapters and articles and everything to the students who were studying and doing distance learning courses so yes blended learning is now an effective tool that we can use for flip classroom how it is different from team based learning so team based learning is an application of flip classroom it's not different team based learning has enhanced and improved and applied flip classroom in a different way using assessment techniques dr shahzia says being a phd scholar i'm going to conduct an experimental research on flip classroom from where can i get training for flipping training so that i can train uh, i'm not sure about the university if they can support you but i'm happy to help you out with uh, this activity and i am happy to be a uh, collaborator with you for these activities as well so my email address uh, is essence8@gmail and there will be last slide where my uh, official email address will be there as well if you are planning uh, flip classroom learning how it can reflect in psychomotor domain as all these teaching activities so like i explained in earlier that we can provide a demonstration videos or and steps and checklist of different procedures and different uh, lectures related to that beforehand students come to the class prepared you provide you take them to a simulated learning room where you ask make their teams and those teams then ask each individual to perform it individually then you ask teams to help each other perform and they learn from that and they can always play back and play again those videos and then you go there conduct use a checklist ask some of them to perform give them corrective feedback improve them and that is how you can use it in a good way in your opinion would it matter if more flip classroom techniques are implemented at end or towards the later part of the module or semester would it be? i think it's difficult what you can do is you can pilot it i'm not saying that you just go ahead on day 1 and start implementing flip classroom just start by piloting it pilot the flip classroom implement it for two or three sessions and see what students feedback is and you will be amazed that the kind of feedback students give would be very nice i remember seeing some of the feedback in some of my evaluation um, i i was a bit conscious as well that my students would not do a lot of work and they would not read a lot of things and i was even thinking that i make breakout rooms i make discussion groups do they actually discuss and they do actually uh, like that thing and later on realize a lot of feedback that i received from students actually said that they loved the small group discussion they loved interaction and they love all those things like who would actually like to sit quiet in your classroom and not speak 
I think naturally we are all social animals and we like to talk to each other. And if you ask them, okay, sit together with your friends, with your class fellows and start discussing these things, start applying these things, give them quizzes. So that's why it's important that the application activities that you create, they need to be interesting as well. And your foundational content that you have provided them for learning at home, it should be applicable and that should help them perform well in the classrooms. So listen, lecture in the class with teacher alone, solve problems alone. It was wasting a great resource while teachers sitting. This is what we need to avoid. We flipped it, listen to lecture passively in, the, in uh, our own time as a video, solve problems with the teacher. Much better use of class time, much better use of teacher's time. And at the same time, and flipped classroom with technology. Nowadays, technology is becoming more common. And I think we used, we need to use technology to solve our, a lot of our problems. Uh, and I think that will make learners fully active, peer learning, and it is aligned with the way the Generation Z are, or Generation Z are. What is the role of teacher in flipped classroom during discussion? So yes, teacher role is coming. Uh, Dr. Amreen in my few slides, and you will be able to see the role of students and as well as the role of teachers. Uh, it is coming up in the future slide. So Shazia Malik, thank you, sir. Looking forward for collaboration from your side. Inshallah, we're looking forward to that. So what kind of technology we can use? So here's an article, and this is a table that I took from 12 tips for using or implementing Clip Classroom. So I think externally produced videos content, there's TED Ed. You don't have to always create your own videos. And I always tell uh, a lot of teacher when I ask them to develop your own videos, you don't have to be a Spielberg or you don't have to be Amir Khan, that you have to be a perfectionist about it. I think all of us have our mobile phones, just open our mobile phone, make a video of yourself and just deliver your content. You don't have to have a very hi-fi camera, a hi-fi thing and sit in a certain way and that is how you're going to teach and train your students. It's okay to just be a normal camera and a normal phone. If you don't want to record yourself, a lot of resources are available on TED-Ed, Vimeo, on YouTube. All you need to do is you need to search for these things. You can develop your own presentations. You can even record using PowerPoint these days. Powtoon is another very interactive and nicely animated presentation. You just have to spend a few bucks and you'll be able to get Powtoon and you can develop your own interactive lectures that you can provide for students to learn virtually. And trust me, your students will love PowerPoints. You can use screencasting software like Camtasia, ShowMe, free iPad app, learning management systems are very important. Learning management system, a lot of institutions do not have Blackboard or access to Moodle. I believe even email is a learning management system. So if you don't have all the content to put on uh, Moodle or Blackboard, just email them, use Dropbox, use Google Drive. Even those are learning management system. Use MS Teams. All these systems can be used for platforms where you can upload a lot of materials and they can actually um, review that content and review that thing. Other content delivery at Modo you can use, EduClipper you can use, social networking applications like Wikispaces, Twitter, Video calling and uh, webcast software like Skype or GoToMeeting, audience, audience response system you can use like Turning Point or Clicker and other polling applications like Poll Everywhere, web-based alternatives. And so many different tools are available for you like Mentimeter, uh, Padlet, different things that we can use at our own time. However, one thing you need to remember is on the road of e-learning, make sure that learning is in the driving seat and technology is in the passenger seat of the map. Because learning decides the destination and technology only helps you get there. This is important. Just because you're using technology does not make your lecture good. Make sure learning is happening and make sure you know your technology quite well. So how do we plan a flipped classroom session? I think uh, we need to follow these three steps. Preparation is very important. Because if you fail to prepare, then prepare to fail. So you need to prepare before the scheduled session time. Practice during the scheduled session time and extend learning after the scheduled session time. So you need to think about the pre and post learning experience that you're going to provide to your students. Before the lecture, what you can do is collect instructional material and content, etc. Now think about it, how I can deliver this content in the best way. 
can I just provide an article? If it's just a two page article, I would worry less. Two pages are good enough. Students should be able to read it on their own. If it's a long book chapter, long to longer topic, maybe I need to make my own videos. Okay, I have made my own videos. I have my PowerPoint presentation. I can record my own talk on that. I can use that. Okay, I don't want to do that. Go on YouTube, find a good video, good resource that students can see. You can just share the link. Go to Vimeo, use that as well and share that content with the students. In any case, make your students accountable. So make your students accountable and that will be more engaging for them. Maybe by doing some quizzes, using Kahoot, using Socrative, so that they know. And I think as a teacher, it's your job to actually observe and see what your students are actually going through. If they're not performing well consistently, if they're all, uh, someone is not contributing consistently over two, three sessions, you need to pick and identify them earlier and speak to them. What is going on? So, Use that to your advantage. I remember asking questions in my class and I used to carry chocolates in my pocket and any student who used to answer my questions, I used to give them chocolates. So that is what used to be fun. My students used to love that, that I'm distributing chocolates with them. So just keep your pocket full of some of sweets and your students will love it. Students are assigned preparatory materials to review as well. Now, uh, there was a question uh, earlier as well from me that what kind of materials we can provide. And I think you can uh, share materials, the different, these are the different materials. Dr. Hasnan asked this question as well. Okay, what sort of activities? It could be textbook chapters, it could be articles, it could be videos, it could be YouTube, Vimeo, your own videos, your PowerPoint presentation, your PDF handout, your keynotes, uh, any form of screen recording using PowerPoint, QuickTime Player, Camtasia, Screencast-O-Matic, uh, PDF handout. You can use all these different things for your um, sessions as well in asynchronous sessions. The, this is important for you to remember that the preparatory material should highlight foundational vocabulary and most important concepts the students need to begin to problem solve. So I always say when you're developing a flip classroom activity or team-based learning, you need to develop it backward. First think about what are the learning outcomes or what are the learning objectives that you want students to achieve and develop a post-class activity accordingly. Make sure that closed cast activity can be done based on the activities that you develop and encourage them to do in the classroom. And then the foundational knowledge, which is required to apply that thing, you need to provide them for the pre-class sessions. So develop backward. Your ultimate goal, that would be the final post-class activity. What I need to learn in order to do that post-class activity, I'll apply that and practice that in the classroom. And what I need to be able to apply, the foundational knowledge, vocabulary, and important concepts, I can do pre-class, before the class. So these are the three levels you develop backward, and then you present the way in the forward fashion. So that is how it is. And you can use learning management system as well. I'll just have a glass of water and then I'll continue. Excuse me. All right, so uh, learning management systems can be used. They are Blackboard, Moodle, very commonly used. People, some people use Canvas. Google Cl Classroom is freely available. Sakai, even MS Teams, some people use it as LMS. And it can be as simple as uh, email or Dropbox or anything like that. Always remember when you're developing a pre-class session, smaller, the better. When you are developing, uh, working on Powtoon or any video or any activity, one screen, one thought. So rule of one, remember that and apply constructivism. So when you're developing an online session, make sure you activate their schema, 
you build on that and then you refine it in your recordings or in your pre pre class room sessions another thing you need to remember and you need to follow is that one size does not fit all so don't just think that you will be providing a lot of reading materials and everyone will come to the class prepared for it. provide reading materials provide videos provide lectures and maybe sometimes provide some quizzes for them to engage with and you can think about all those experiences that you can provide before the class in a asynchronous fashion either through lms through email through dropbox or through any way i have practiced this with post graduate students who are working in hamad in different hospitals they have very difficult and uh, working professionals so if they can go through that material in order to apply it in the classroom then i think undergraduate students who do not have any other job technically and studying is their full time work they should be able to go through all that material and because you have given them one week to actually go through it they should have enough flexibility in their life for that this is another thing i would like to suggest that when you are developing the materials or when you are developing or thinking about your classroom always use a buffet approach and buffet approach means that you provide the student with different experiences different things and they would love it i have done it in the past and it has worked wonders it has worked very effectively as well and this uh, takes me to my slide that i was talking to you about now if i start very small you don't have to be a spielberg you don't have to be a perfectionist you don't have to be amir khan you don't have to be um, creating videos and say that i can't do this because i don't have a camera or i don't have a dslr or i don't have a hi fi uh, microphone start very small if you don't want to make a video you can actually use other people's stuff as well use other people stuff if you are not going to develop content there's a lot of content which is uh, available on khan academy a lot of content which is available on youtube a lot of content which is available on vimeo a lot of content in coursera just need to explore you need to start exploring every time i'm looking at videos on ted and everything i keep on thinking where i can use this effectively even on mobile phones i see a lot of videos and i keep on thinking can i use this uh, activity in my classroom can i apply it in any other way as well and that is what you need to keep on thinking as well and this is important so make sure you do things in that way and there are different other video interaction software available as well where for example uh, ed puzzle that i've used is that you are using um, uh, a video you are teaching something and then you just stop and introduce an mcq over there so students have to solve that quiz or that mcq before they move on and continue with that video so you develop when you are developing videos if you have advanced knowledge or if you can use these are very easy to use softwares at puzzle and everything available online you just and they are cheap as well you just introduce different quizzes different ways of doing things in your lecture and provide all that material before that so your class time is being used effectively as well so i hope dr snan you have a lot of ideas about how you can effectively use different things hi professor asan can we share with them post class assessment layout if yes how much of it so post class assessment layout uh, the thing is uh, i would suggest that we make it formative rather than summative assessment in any way so uh, because i would not want them to be disadvantaged it's just group learning and peer assisted learning so uh, if it is post class assessment it should be formative and if it is formative then yes it can be shared with the students in any way so hamza is asking so in class you create culture of critical thinking where whatever they have gained from providing material yes exactly with peers and you facilitate them in acquiring yes exactly so in essence you work on checking their understanding application analysis exactly hamza uh, in class time you are using for uh, higher order thinking and that is what teachers are for as a, a phd my job is not to teach someone 
to remember and recall because you cannot make them remember a definition. They have to do it on their own. And that is what you need to do. You need to make it more learner centered. Now, during the session, so more resources for you, Dr. Hasnan. Uh, during the session, you can use quizzes, you can use polls. So for quizzes, I have personally used Socrative, I've used Kahoot, students enjoyed it when they have to practice it. Polls, I've used Poll Everywhere, Mentimeter, Peer Teaching. I, in OSCEs, I've used Peer Teaching as well. I've made groups, I've made sure everyone's teaching each other, everyone's helping each other. Uh, give them group where they have to pre do presentations, uh, read about something or they have to do activity using Padlet, discussion boards, and then present that. You develop a lot of other skills in this form of learning as well. It's not just you're learning about these things, you're also learning to become a good leader, you're also learning to become a good communicator, you're also learning interpersonal skills. You're also learning to work in groups. So it's not just about that topic, which is the benefit of this technique, but there are a lot of other competencies which are really very important. You learn how to do research. Research does not, I'm not saying that you come up with the paper, but actually you will develop skills for searching about things, about be, you become more self-directed lifelong learner. And all those things will be inculcated with you because as a teacher, I can show you the door, but you have to go through it yourself. You cannot push someone to go through it. So you need to encourage them to do different things. Group projects can also be helpful. Just make sure that your students have different diverse learning styles. So you provide them a variety of activities, a buffet, as I explained them before. In the past, I've used gamification as well in my classroom using puzzles, using um, Kahoot, I would say, and different activities where there are uh, a joyful competition amongst each other. And all I've used is chocolate and it has done really good stuff. And uh, I think these are some of the tools that I've used Socrative, Kahoot, Moodle has built-in systems as well. There are Google Forms you can use. They are all, uh, Google Form is free. Kahoot is free for certain 50 students. Socrative is free for 50 students. Microsoft Forms or quiz can be used, PowerPoint presentations. You can simply use MCQ and make that on your own PowerPoint presentation and then ask them, give them charts A, B, C, D. And each group will have four charts A, B, C, D, and then they just raise their A or raise their B or raise their C. I think only raising this in the classroom will actually encourage them or re-engage them in different learning experiences as well. And it will keep the activity really nice as well. Question mark perception tool, I've used that in the past for developing MCQs and different things as well. After the session, what would happen? You can have a post-test, you can have a formative assessment, you can review, reflect, and act upon the feedback and experiences. You can do self-evaluation, you can do revision of work-based feedback, so many different things, and you can give them post-class activities as well. Now, coming back to the question Dr. Ambreen asked earlier about the role of teacher. What would be the role of teacher in this activity? So the role of teacher would be to create learning condition conducive to questioning. So you need to develop a safe learning environment. I think this is something really important and this is something uh, we tend to um, um, not do. So you need to develop a safe learning environment where students know that they can discuss, they can make some noise. I remember conducting a workshop early on where I say that uh, don't shut up, but make some noise. That was the title of that workshop. So I think we need to encourage students uh, early on in our education. All we need to, we used to do is we used to tell our students, keep quiet, don't make noise. And we used to less like the questions answer technique. I think this needs to change and we need to make more safe uh, learning environments. Instead of transferring knowledge directly, be a guide to make learning easy. So your job is not to be the sage of the stage. You have to be the guide. If someone has not studied anything and they ask you, doctor, can you just explain everything to me? You just say, go watch that video. You have to be a bit harsh on initially so that students know that you're not going to repeat all those concepts. Yes, if they have a very valid question, they want to understand something, then go ahead. But initially you have to make a statement that no, you're not going to lecture what you have provided in an asynchronous way before and you have to uh, ask students to do it beforehand. Having one-to-one -one interaction with students, I think this would be very important as well. Correcting misunderstandings. So look at difficult concepts. That's why I really like team-based learning activity because team-based learning 
especially using Socrative and Kahoot helps you understand that what are the concepts that students are struggling with when you are uh, looking at IRAT and DRAT uh, results, you can actually see that what are the concepts. I have a few slides on team-based learning, so I'm going to quickly discuss that in a bit as well. Individualizing learning for each student, this is important. So provide them with all different resources, videos, PowerPoint presentations, PDFs, lecture notes, so that anyone who wants to learn in different ways can learn in that way. Using technology suitable for learning conditions, creating interactive discussion conditions, so discussion boards or blogs is sometimes we can use as well, in, or even WhatsApp groups, a lot of people are using that for teaching learning purpose. Facebook groups, people are using that for teaching learning purpose. Increasing participation of students and sharing lecture videos as an out of class activity and providing feedback by using pedagogical strategies. So please guide us on how the PG student session should be conducted. So I think in the same way, Dr. Shakila, postgraduate students can look at, uh, you can develop content and I think uh, um, you have you can use a, a learning management system where you can record in your own convenience all your sessions, provide them, provide them on day one. You can say, okay, go through session number one or video number one in this week and we can discuss it next day or next week whenever they are coming. So even if you are not having an LMS or Moodle in your uh, university, you can still use a flash drive to just transfer all that material. Study guide is not necessary, but study guide is something really very useful because students will have hundreds of questions from you. So study guide answers a lot of questions. It's just like a frequently asked question guide or an instructional guide, just like you go and drive a car. A lot of people would drive a car without writing, reading any guide, but sometimes if they are stuck with anything, that guide would really help them. So I think it makes your life easier that instead of them calling you or asking you everything, your study guide will be useful and help you. How to prevent students from using technology during class? I think why we have to prevent them as long as they are doing the job, if they are using Facebook or WhatsApp or doing anything else in between, it's fine as long as their team has done the job. And you will be observing them throughout as well. So um, if you think like that, they're not working, then you can actually go around them and re-engage them. And I'm sure they will be re-engaged in your session as well. An example of individualizing learning. So like I said, provide them a buffet approach. So when you provide them a buffet approach, everyone, I would like to watch video, someone else would like to use like uh, a PDF, someone else would like to read a book, someone else would like to write, read an article. So when you provide multiple resources, you cater for people with all different learning styles and for their individualized learning styles as well. So what is the role of students? This is something uh, you can say that we need to sort out or you need to uh, set ground rules with on day one is that in flipped classroom approach, students transform from passive receiver of knowledge to active promoter of knowledge. And this is what they need to work on as well. Take responsibilities for their own learning. So encourage students that they need to take responsibility for their own learning as well. Watching lecture videos before the course and preparing for the course by using learning materials as well. Learning at his own learning speed, maybe make necessary interaction with his, uh, making necessary interaction with his teachers, friends, taking and giving feedback. These are all roles of the students that you can paste. You can set them as ground rules. You can tell that to the students as well that they need to participate in class discussions. They need to participate in group discussion. You can keep formative marks or you can assess them formatively or you can even see that if someone is not interacting or someone is not helping, you can have a discussion with them. You can have feedback with them, session with them and see if they are having any difficulty, any challenges and how you can help them as well. Does it work? So according to the study of 200 educators, 85% saw improved grades when they implemented flipped classroom. So yes, it does work. When you make students do the job, do the thing, it's 100 times better than delivering a lecture with passive learners. One in five teachers is already thinking about flipping their classroom, are you? So just add the, I think there's no chat box. So I would expect that you would be flipping your classroom as well. How to reduce distraction of students from learning through technology? Uh, I think it depends on the task that you provide them in the classroom. So if there's a task they need to complete in those 30, 40 minutes, and uh, 
if that task is properly structured, properly organized, uh, or if in the team-based learning, when um, um, you have a team, uh, uh, an individual readiness assurance test or a team readiness assurance test, or you, you can use Socrative as well, where they can first do that uh, quiz or anything like that individually. So they will be engaged in that. Then you ask them to do it uh, in groups uh, and they are engaged in that. So if they're spending and they are participating in those Socrative activities. I think they will be have less time for other things. and. Why they are actually distracted is because your lecture is boring. So when you're lecture, you're not lecturing, you're making them have a discussion with each other, talking to each other and making groups, they would be more interested rather than being distracted. So, and I think mobile phones or technology, we need to allow them to use it for searching, for learning new things, and this is fine. So what are the advantages of Flip Classroom? So enable learners to practice higher order skills inside the classroom with tutor guidance. Increase motivation, enables deeper learning and provides for better information. So there was a question early on that how we can convince students and parents. I think we can talk about all those advantages which are from the uh, different uh, literature. Can we apply flipped classroom places like clinics, outdoors for teaching? Yes, uh, I've discussed earlier on that the same procedure or same thing that you're going to perform, you can just send them a video of that performance, give them a checklist of the different steps and make their groups and allow them to do it and then go for a formative OSCE, ask them to perform it, assess them, give them feedback and that is how you can teach them as well. So they'll be learning on their own, they'll be learning from each other in groups and then they'll be learning from you and you will give them corrective feedback as well. And this way you'll be able to teach them a lot of clinical skills. I hope it answers Dr. Khaled's questions. Increase productivity for both the tutor and the students. It increases interactive period within the class. So students are more interactive. So that's why they will be less distracted when they will be more interactive. They are only distracted when they get bored. Students can access lecture videos whenever and wherever they want and it enables students to learn at their own speed. So if someone asks you to repeat their lecture, you ask them, go and watch the recording. You don't have to repeat it yourself. They can always watch the recording, they can play, they can pause, they can forward, they can revise, they can use it on their own time. Students that are educated with this approach are encouraged to think both within and out of the class. Now, this is an important advantage as well. So they're not just learning within the class. And sometimes even we have difficulties in terms of contact hours and credit hours that we have a very small day and how I can actually utilize my contact hours. So if you're giving them activity to do at home, you can count that towards contact hours as well. If they are studying one hour at home in the evening, you can self-directed learning is part of your contact hours or part of your credit hours. Asynchronous learning is part of your contact hours or credit hours. So you can utilize that and you can put that in terms of curriculum as well, that this is what they need to use and this is uh, how it will be. So these are a lot of advantages, something that uh, you can actually use and something that you can actually inculcate in your students as well. Now about the limitations, increased screen time. So yes, as you guys have mentioned previously, I agree, there will be increased screen time for students and this is one of the limitations as well. It relies on preparations. So student may not come to the class may come to the class without preparation. So this might happen, but there's a way to counter it that you make a statement by not repeating anything to students. If someone is not coming to the class prepared, they need to feel that they are not prepared and that's why they are unable to contribute. And that is why they're not helping. And their peers, their colleagues, they should actually help explain it to them that why it is important. If you, someone is seeing, showing this behavior continuously, then you need to give them feedback as well. Relies on trust that students will work and are motivated. Hard to prepare good quality materials, videos, and it is time consuming. So yes, first time it is difficult. First time it is time consuming, but later on it is not. Yes, uh, Dr. Bakar, you start with video and then and when they come to the OT skills or over there, you encourage peer assisted learning and then you can inculcate and guide them further with that as well. But if you are going to demonstrate the skills to everyone, all the students, you can more likely develop a video of that as well. And always develop a checklist as well, that these are the exact steps that we need to follow. So they are watching the video, they're looking at the checklist, 
And then in a peer assisted learning, they're helping each other learn that skill in the classroom as well. And then you go there, conduct a formative OSCE with them using their checklist, give them feedback, refine their skills and help them improve. I think this applies to both preclinical, clinical and basic science sessions. Lack of equipment such as smartphones, tablets, computers, having internet problems, again, that's a limitation. Biggest task in preparing in-class activities, integrating them to flip classrooms. So yes, it requires a team approach. You need to sit down, you need to brainstorm, you need to think about what activities will be in class, what activities will be before class, what activities will be post class. In contrast to what is known, this method increases the workload of teachers instead of relieving it. So yes, initially it is a lot of work as well. I agree with that as well. So we have been discussing uh, about team-based learning. So I just quickly talk about it in a few more slides and then we can call it a day as well. Team-based learning is basically an application of flipped classroom. And this is something that I have really used in so many different ways and even in an online fashion as well. Team-based learning makes teams just like jury and uh, what usually happens in a jury, jury is uh, usually in USA, the judge has a jury where different people, they discuss and then they argue and then they agree on certain points. So it's the same concept that is being used in team-based learning where different teams actually first discuss things amongst each other, agree upon certain things, and then different teams argue with each other as well. And they have a discussion as well. And that is the entire process of uh, team-based learning as well, where again, this readings part is the pre-class part. You provide and develop readings or videos or any materials that you need to provide beforehand for the classroom. When, how to engage the students? Students are told that when they come to the class, they will have to give a short quiz or a short test. They come to the class. I have used Socrative and Kahoot for this activity a lot. And I give them an IRAD. IRAD stands for Individual Readiness Assurance Test. You give them a test which is based on 10, 20 or 15 MCQs from the readings or from the material that you've provided for them to work at. They do that test. You have the scores immediately with you that how students are performing. Then you make their teams and then ask them to do the same test again. But this time, each question they have to answer and have a discussion with each other and agree as a team. So they learn with, from and about each other and they learn everything from each other in groups in peer assisted learning fashion. And this way they solve each MCQs. And you just say that then towards the end, each team will say, okay, this is the question. And we thought the answer is A. Team B will say, we thought the answer is B. And then you encourage, encourage a discussion among the two groups. Why do they think it's A? Why do they think it's B? Until they agree on certain points. And if they, you think they are not agreeing on certain things, something is not clear, then you need to explain it in the form of mini lecture, or they will appeal to you uh, if they are unable to answer. Even then you can ask them, okay, first, first search online, first search on your own. If you could not find the answer, then come to me. So you only give a mini lecture. Mini lecture means five, 10, 15 minutes only focused on specific things that they were unable to understand or something which are unclear or something which are difficult. And then you can give multiple application activities after the class as well related to that task. So set ground rules for good team behaviors that there will be assessment in the class. You have to do it individually, then you have to do it in teams. It can be form of formative assessment. It can have certain weightage for, towards summative assessment. And then you can publish group-wise results as well. One good practice is to publish the group-wise result and say that this group is leading and have done the most quizzes and IRAT and TRATs in the best way possible. So you can actually give reward to someone who scored highest in IRAT in all the sessions or the team that scored highest in a TRAT in all the sessions as well. And then you can ask them if they are unclear, two groups say it's A, one group say it's B. They have to convince and have a discussion with each other. Either they will resolve it or if they are unable to resolve it, then they'll go, or you can ask them to go online, look for evidence. And even if then, if they are unable to answer that, then they should be able to actually uh, ask you and appeal to you. And then you give a so small mini lecture on the few concepts which are problematic to students. Application exercise could be case scenario. It could be assignment. It could be case-based discussion. 
It could be a modified essay question. It could be a script concordance test. It could be a discussion forum. It could be reflection. It could be anything. Anything that requires them to explain their thought process, they requires them to justify answers. And whatever they do, they have to provide a recorded evidence of what they have done of the from the post-class activity. So there should be an outcome that they need to submit it on Blackboard or submit it through email or submit it in some way so that you know that they have done that activity and you can create, keep some weightage for that. And if you keep on encouraging higher order thinking, then your assessment will be more aligned with it as well. And you can do an assessment with C3 level as well. So like I explained early on that you create team-based learning in a backward design fashion, develop learning outcomes first, design the application post-class activity or application exercise, identify what specific knowledge is needed for that application, develop preparatory materials that helps them apply, develop your individual readiness assurance test or team readiness assurance test based on that preparatory material, and then send that preparatory material beforehand or pilot it first with students, and then you'll be able to see if there is anything you need to change before giving it to your junior students as well. So that is the entire process. If uh, it is more like a workshop, I would have given you an activity and then you would have given feedback, but I think uh, it's a seminar based uh, session today. So I won't be able to give you an activity. So I think uh, it's time to let's wrap the session up. Uh, and uh, I would say, and I'll end with the last quote of Elvin Toffler. And he said, the illiterate of 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn. So we are going through a rapidly changing educational landscape and we need to continuously unlearn and relearn new things in order to keep up with the pace. And keeping up is very, very important. And keeping up does not mean that whatever you are doing, you're not doing it in a good way or you're not doing a good job. But even if you're doing good in whatever you are doing, the world around us is changing continuously. Nokia was making very nice phones. Still, they could not keep up pace with the smartphone technology. Kodak industry was developing very nice radiographic films, but the world moved toward digital industry. The taxis industry cannot keep up with the Uber and Kareem and all those services. So I think the world around us is changing rapidly and we need to be innovative. So we need to unlearn what we have done in the past, even if it was good, and we need to relearn and keep up with the rapidly changing environment. And I think with this, uh, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for listening. Those who have been asking for my email address, this is my email address, please feel free to email me. And if you have any questions, if you want a PowerPoint, yes, I will send you the PowerPoint as well. Just send me an email and I'll respond back to you. If you have any other questions, feel free to answer. And if you have no questions, then thank you very much for your time. And I'm glad to see over 100 uh, participants uh, taking this session and taking time out uh, from your busy schedules. Thank you very much. So I think recordings and everything will be shared uh, by the Rifar team. And uh, I think I can always send you an email. If you send me a nice email, I'll respond back with my PowerPoint slides as well. And thank you very much, all of you, for attending and for being a very nice audience or for your interaction as well. And uh, yeah. Have a nice day, everyone. For CME certificates, I think uh, Rifa will be able to help you out with that.
Thank you, Ji. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Zafarbi, are you there? Ji, Sadi Bhai, bolye. Sir, ne actually break di hai ya sir, nu vaise put kar di. End kar di sir. Ji? End kar di sir. Sir, ne end kar di hai. Haan ji. Chalo sir. End kar dun na Sadi Bhai. Ji? Me end kar dun usko. Haan, fir ab end kar di. पार्टिसिपेंट की हम आवाज सुन सकते हैं किसी को अगर कोई क्वेश्चन वगैरह है वो तो सर हो गया हो तो ठीक है फिर जाने दे ओके ओके थैंक यू 